See, they understood that Jesus had power, but they didn't understand that he was power. They understood that Jesus was from God, but they didn't understand that he himself was God. So this external danger of a storm is really just a picture of an internal danger of not really knowing who Jesus is. And, and I, it's it's hard to lead music when you're getting ready to preach because I'm I'm like reviewing my sermon while I'm trying to worship with you all and there's just a lot of stuff that's going on in this brain of mine and it has a little capacitor in it uh, so I try not to short out but I, I'm I'm thinking today about about this message and I'm thinking about sometimes our struggle to kind of crank this this engine to get this this engine going that is the church and uh, I want to ask you today uh, what is something that God has done for you that you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God has done for you does everybody have one. At least one, right? You have at least one. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think of one. I want you to think of one of those things, one of those instances where God really showed you who he was, okay? Now, if you have a piece of paper, you can write it down. That would be a great idea. You might forget by the end of the sermon. Um, Tell your neighbor if you think you'll forget and you don't have a piece of paper. Tell your neighbor to remember that thing for you. But we all have these these things in our life uh, that, that God has done for us, and we come to these points in our life sometimes where we need to recall the leftovers, right? Where we need to recall those things because we're in this, I uh, can't get the engine to fire. Uh, so, so we've got to recall those things. Um, I want to start this, this morning with a bit of information that Mark leaves us at the end of the feeding of the 5,000. He tells us that the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. That's way more than they started with, right? Uh, way more than they started with. But that tells us uh, more than one thing, but this one thing for sure, God supplies more than enough. God supplies more than enough. He will never leave us short. Amen. He satisfies us and then some. And then some. That, that was the leftovers for the disciples. Uh, so the disciples have had a pretty exhausting day. Uh, if you don't know this, check out the last couple weeks' sermons or read for yourself in Mark 6. Um, I'm sure at this moment of the feeding the 5,000 that the disciples followed the same rule that we have here at the church where the pastors eat last. So the disciples had probably served all, all the staff is laughing at that and you don't get it, it's okay. Uh, so they're feeding the 5,000 and the disciples are probably waiting to last to eat and then it, it, it seems like uh, something is, is happening but Jesus is teaching the disciples in this moment that when you think your tank is empty, you have more to give. You have more to give. They have more to share. And after all this work was done, there was a basketful for each and every one of the disciples. In John 6, 12, it says, When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. Let nothing be wasted. When God tells you to gather something, gather it. When God tells you to gather something, hang on to it. Don't throw it out. Don't be wasteful with it. I read this quote uh, the other day. It says, the wasteful have as little to give as the poor. And the people who do the most in this world waste the least. So do you still have that thing? You still have that thing God's done for you? Did you forget it yet? All right, I want you to grab it. I want you to put it in your pocket, okay? Put it in your pocket. Come on. Put it in your pocket. Thank you. Thank you. It sits in your pocket. Just hang on to it. We'll need that later. Remember what pocket you put it in. So the scraps are all gathered up. The disciples are thinking, are we finally going to get this rest you have been talking about. 
Then the Bible says, immediately, Jesus made his disciples get in the boat. Made them. So we're given this picture that possibly something crazy is starting to happen. Maybe there's an emergency, there's a crisis situation. Uh, John tells us in in the, the Gospel of John, this story, that the people were ready to take Jesus and to make him king by force. So Jesus makes the disciples get into a boat, and then Jesus goes on up to the mountainside to pray by himself. Now, maybe that doesn't interest you, but if you, if you do a little bit of digging, when, when Mark writes the gospel, uh, three times he mentions that Jesus goes off to pray, and in each instance that Mark mentions Jesus going off to pray, it is a crisis situation. So just some, some food for thought there. So the disciples jump in the boat, right? The tired and hungry disciples with basketfuls of leftover, jump in a boat to paddle away. Yes, paddle away. They didn't get into the speedboat or on the cruise ship. They got into a paddle boat on a lake. And they're hungry and they're tired. Do you feel sorry for the disciples yet? Slightly, yes I do. So they're out there and the wind picks up. So they're in this windstorm on a body of water, and the waves begin to pick up. So I had a neat experience uh, just a couple months ago to be on the Sea of Galilee in a boat, and really it's not a sea, okay, it's a lake, uh, we, we, we all know that, and uh, I, I got to talk to one of the guys who had been on this trip to Israel quite a few times, and you get on this boat that's probably a bigger boat than what the disciples were on anyway. And he said, you know, I always wondered about that story on this lake. Because it doesn't look like big enough like, oh, here comes a storm, let's paddle off to the shore real quick. But he said a few years ago when they were there, a storm came over the mountain. And he said, in no time, the sea was rocky and the, the, the guys on the boat, the guides that do this every day multiple times, started to panic because they know what happens when a storm comes up on the Sea of Galilee. It is serious business. So these disciples are fishermen. They had been on the lake quite a bit uh, in their life. Their entire life had been spent on the lake. But now they're in this storm. So it can happen. And the one night, uh, I have issues sleeping, so I would go out into the lobby and I would talk to the Muslim workers uh, during the night. They was just out there playing video games on their phones. So I would talk to them. Then I went out on the porch, and it was probably 2 or 3 in the morning. And I remember sitting there, it was just a nice, calm, probably mid-60s night. And all of a sudden, just, and I said, all right, God, I get it. I get it. It can happen. It really can happen. So this would have been a terrifying thing. So I want to ask you this question. Uh, Has life ever been brutal to you? Has life ever given you a storm, a windstorm, and put you in a paddle boat? Yes, we've all all been in the paddle boat in the middle of the storm. And who gets the blame for this chaos in our life? Typically, we, we blame the devil, right? Oh, that stupid devil. That devil's just after me. Can you believe what he's got me walking through? But I kind of looked at the scripture uh, this way, and I think we give the the devil way more credit for our sufferings than he deserves. Uh, Ask you a few questions here. Who told the disciples to get in the boat? Jesus. Who told them where to go? Jesus. And who stayed behind? Ah, man. (laughs) It's, it's his fault. It, it is the fault of Jesus that this is all happening to the disciples. Now, when we're in the boat, oh, that devil. Oh, that devil. But what if it's Jesus? What if it's, what if it's Jesus? So what's, what's going on here with the disciples? I think it's the same thing that's happening here today. Christ is collecting followers. Listen here. Not just to receive the work of his kingdom, but to do the work of his kingdom. That's what followers do. They don't just receive it, they do it. And what does this work of the kingdom require out of us? What does it require us to have? 
faith. John 15, 16 says, you did not chose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. So faith is what keeps our fruit fresh, and it keeps our fruit effective. Essentially, without faith, we fail. But faith isn't a gift that we're just given. This is where some people get it wrong. Faith is actually a process. Faith is given by God through the means of what I like to call uncomfortable grace. Paul Tripp puts it this way. God will take you where you haven't intended to go in order to produce in you what you could not achieve on your own. And the Bible calls that grace. You see, we, we've got this, this enemy that's whispering in our ear from the pulpits of many churches all over uh, this nation about what grace is. And I'll tell you, most of what you hear grace is, grace is not. Grace is God putting you through something to grow your faith. Sometimes grace is the hard thing. Sometimes grace is the boat in the storm on the lake. That's grace. So Jesus, in his giving of grace, made the disciples get into the boat. So why would Jesus put us in such an uncomfortable place? Well, it's because he knows what we need. He knows what we need. So here he comes, walking on water. That's amazing. He's walking on water. Like, we've heard that since we were a little kid, but do you understand what walking on water is, folks? He's the only one that's ever done it. And he did it in the midst of a storm. That, like, that should get, that should get you all fired up on the inside that Jesus came walking on the water. Don't, don't be so passive about, about reading the Bible and what the Scripture says. Jesus walks on water. So put yourself in the story, right? One thing that I think will help you uh, get through life a lot easier, uh, help you in your walk with Christ, is when you recognize that Jesus is slow. Jesus is slow. Amen? Amen. He is. Uh, I've never read anywhere in Scripture where Jesus ran somewhere. Paul did. You know, Paul talks about running a little bit. Never Jesus. Jesus never ran, I don't think. Not that I read. So uh, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's still slow, all right? Just, he's still slow. He's still slow. And you're in a storm and you're exhausted, and here comes Jesus walking, just walking. Faith doesn't come natural to us. We don't like to be stretched. We don't like to grow, really. The disciples are in trouble, uh, some serious trouble, and Jesus comes walking. Why did Jesus walk? That's what I ask myself when I read this. Jesus, why are you walking? Well, because he's not after relieving difficulties in our life. Jesus is after redeeming people. He could have just ran up and stopped everything. But he wasn't so worried about the boat and the storm and its sinking and all of that. He was more worried about redeeming those who were in the storm. So you might wonder, why is God taking so long to respond to your circumstances? Why there's no relief for you? And I say to that, take heart. He's in the process of redeeming. He's in the process of redeeming. You're about to see some glory. That's, that's it. So the scripture goes on to say, he was about to pass by them. Now, when I, when I read that, I thought, 
well, that would be mean. Like, that would be mean. You're out there, they're all panicking. He's like, oh, look, I'm just going to walk on to Bethsaida, right? But I, I started doing some, some word studies then because it didn't make sense that Jesus would just leave them out there in the middle of the lake, right? Jesus didn't plan to leave them there. That's not what it means. And, and this is where I, I challenge you as a church to really engage the Scripture. This is phenomenal what you learn from this. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to read some Scriptures to you that use the same word as pass them by that we just read in Mark, okay? Just hang on to your seat. This is amazing. Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. Did you catch that? And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock when my glory Passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Exodus 33, 18 through 23. Moses was about to see what? The glory. The back side of the glory. Because the front side would have killed him. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. That's 1 Kings 19, 1 through 13. This is John 1, 36. When John the Baptist saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Then Luke 18, 37 through 38. Now hearing a crowd going by, the blind began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he, the blind man, called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Do you see what happened every time the scripture tells us that Jesus or or God was about to pass by? It was an opportunity for people, humans, to see his glory. Doesn't that just change your perspective of being in a boat in a storm? The disciples were about to see the glory of God. There's a purpose for the storm. There's a purpose for the trial. Understand that Jesus is calmly walking on that which gives the disciples the most heartache. Because the storm is no match for the Savior. So they're in this storm and Jesus is walking, walking. So what do they do? They're the disciples, right? They start singing worship songs. Yes, they start singing oceans. You call me out upon the water. Right? That's where that song was written. You didn't know that. No, that's not what happened. They were terrified. And I would have probably been terrified with them, right? We've been in the storm. We've been terrified. But see, stress has this way of distorting our view, right? It has a way of getting us to forget things. It has a way of getting us to check over our shoulders and watch our back. It makes us think that everything is out to get us. So we yell in fear. It makes everything worse. We lose time to pray when we're focused on what we're scared over. We forget about the scriptures when we're in fear. And therefore, we forget who we are. And more importantly, we forget whose we are. So here the disciples are, lost, totally lost. But what I like about this 
is we see the tenderness of Christ. Now, somebody needs to hear this today. He comes towards the boat. He comes towards the boat, and he says, take courage. It is I. That's big. That's big. He, he says, hey, don't be afraid. I am. I am. Is here. So you think about all the time that the disciples would have had to get this right. Think about all the time and effort that Christ had put into teaching them. And here they are, scared of him. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm Jesus. And I'm like, oh, guys, get it together, you bunch of sissies. I'm not a ghost. That's not Jesus, though. He's tender. He walks to the boat. He didn't yell. He didn't run off and find new disciples. What did he do? He just spoke to them. He just spoke to them. Listen, listen for his voice. John 10, 27 and 28 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The boat was never going to sink. But Jimmy, I've never heard his voice. Yes, you have. It's right here. You can hear it any time you want to hear it. But then something amazing happens, and, and I think we overlook this part of the story all the time. Jesus got in their boat. Think about that for a second. Jesus got in their boat. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in your storm, he might be walking, but when he gets there, he's going to get in your boat. That's phenomenal. That is a tender, loving Savior. So when we're paralyzed by fear, we can praise God that Jesus gets in our boat. He gets in our boat. And it says that they're completely amazed, right? The disciples are completely amazed, right? And this really isn't a compliment because of how it's attached to the next phrase because it says, for they had not understood about the loaves. And to be honest with you, when I read that, I didn't understand about the loaves either. It didn't make any sense to me. What do the loaves have to do with any of this, right? The disciples hadn't learned their lesson. They forgot to remember the scraps. You see, what it should have said was, and they had faith because they remembered the leftovers. But they didn't remember them. They didn't remember them. See, they understood that Jesus had power, but they didn't understand that he was power. They understood that Jesus was from God, but they didn't understand that he himself was God. So this external danger of a storm is really just a picture of an internal danger of not really knowing who Jesus is. Their physical struggling and painful attempt to make headway through the storm was a picture of their spiritual struggle in trying to understand who Jesus really was. And this is a common danger we face today. The disciples were always around Jesus. His teaching and his kingdom work. However, they were still missing who he was. There is a way to be around Jesus without ever really knowing him. There's a way to be around Jesus. There's a way to be in Sunday school, come to church, family night, 
serve on a board, read your Bible, pray, and not really know Jesus. He wanted to show the disciples that he was God in all the fullness of his glory. We can't let difficulties in our life harden our hearts. We have to embrace them. We have to hang on. And we have to watch for the Savior. Because he's walking to us. He's not mad. And he doesn't want us to be afraid. He just wants to see our faith grow. And as cool as it is that he walked on water, I just can't get over the fact that he got in the boat. I just can't get over that. So you're in a storm and the wind's blowing. Stop paddling. Walk to the edge. And just let Jesus in the boat. Just let him in. So what are your scraps? What are your scraps? What's that piece of imaginary paper that you put in your pockets say? Maybe today we just need to thank God for leftovers. You've seen him move, but now is your faith strong enough to know that he'll move again? Maybe today is the leftovers that you'll need to recall at some later time in life. Maybe we need to be reminded about all the good things that he's already done for you. Because I would have to say, if he never did another good thing for me, he's still God. He's still worthy of praise. I don't need him to keep laying things in front of me in order for me to love him for what he's already done. So today I want you to remember, I want the church to remember, I'm here today because he was there yesterday. That's why I'm here. Remember the scraps. Remember the leftovers. Get a to-go container and take them with you everywhere you go. Because you never know when life's going to hit you and you're going to need to pop open that styrofoam container and be reminded of the greatness of our God. Amen.